it is good to see you guys. Good morning. Hey, I want to ask y'all to stand up and, and as you're stretching, as you're, as you're getting up and comfy, I just want to toss out a quick thought. Just in case you've ever had the, the, the falls, but in case you ever had the idea that sometimes BJ is just being coy, being cheeky with his self-deprecating humor and stuff. Man, I'm going to tell you right now, I shouldn't be here today. I, I don't, I don't want to be here today. This is one of the mornings. This week has been a crap storm, okay? I, I had to miss three days of work. I had, because of an injury issue, I had family crap blow up in my face. I have had so many chaotic things that have slammed me this week. And here's the beauty of what's happening. Jesus is still in front of my face and I want to be with him this morning. I want to worship Jesus because I'm like, dude, the, 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 the other option is despair. The other option, the only other thing on the table is run and cry, right? Like, that's what I want to do. How many of you guys have ever seen the movie Star Wars? Heck yeah. I was watching some with my, my daughter yesterday. It's one of my favorite movie sets ever, but the stupidest thing I've ever heard is also in that movie set. Over and over, they come back to this thought, and it says, trust your feelings. Good Lord, you talk about idiocy. Don't trust your feelings, BJ, because my feelings want to curl up and cry right now. My feelings want to run away and hide. But that's not what we're doing. Today, we're celebrating an Advent week where we are celebrating, where we are appreciating, where we're paying attention to joy. And joy is not a feeling. Not even close. Joy is a perspective, amen? It's a, it's a choice that we make. It's not a feeling. And I choose joy. I choose Jesus. I want to worship. And I'm not putting myself on a pedestal saying, look at me, be like me. I'm saying, I bet there's a couple of us out here in a boat similar to me. I want to worship with you guys. Would you, would you open your hearts up today to the possibility, to the, the sliver of chance that God is going to speak to us, move in us, and draw us closer to him? through our time gathered in his family together. Would you worship with us this morning?
you've done for me. It's not because of us, is it? We sure as heck don't deserve it. It is him and his grace that we can have joy. Amen. what we do this morning God we come before the holy king of kings the one who who is second to none the one who has no equal we stand before you God humble broken all kind of messed up but covered by your grace this morning we thank you for who you are we thank you obviously for all that you have done God we thank you for bringing us here this morning would you speak to us now would you move in our midst? We love you in Jesus' name and God's people said. Amen. I'm laughing because oh, I have a step. I brought it from home, out of my closet. No, it's so loud. Okay, I'll turn it. Okay. <laughs> I love Advent. You know how much I love Advent. And somebody asked me this week, when I was telling the story of Advent actually at school, another pastor came up to me and said, I have never heard that before. And I was like, really? And they said, we've never done that in our church growing up. And I said, I'm sorry, I hope you learned something. And I gave them a paper. I said, I wrote this years ago. And I said, but I love Advent. Why? Because it's our heritage. It is, it is part of the journey and we can feel that. And um, it's exciting. And so today, well, let's review. Do you remember what our colors stand for? 
The purple is kids, royalty, dignity. Yes, he was royal. He was the king of kings. And the white candle is for who? Christ, that's right. Yes, you got it. That's right. Well, today is my favorite candle, probably because it's halfway in the journey. And so I was trying to, um, one of my favorite Christmas songs is A Baby Changes Everything. And that came on the radio this morning, and I just stopped, and I just sat down, and I just put my head down and listened again to the words, because it talks about the journey and how, how Mary felt, and how it was so changing for her and Joseph. And so today, though, is the spirit. It is the joy. It is the candle of joy. Our other candles, again, were the candle of hope the first week, and then the candle of peace last week. And this week, the candle of joy. The pink. Pink stands for joy and laughter. I don't know about you, but I really laugh a lot. And I really love it because it's really good for your skin, ladies. And uh, if you laugh. But what it is, it just showed that there was something special coming. And the other name for our candle is the candle of the angels. The candle of the angels, in other words, the messengers. The angels were and are the messengers who convey what God wants us to know. And so they appeared a lot in our story. And I made sure I tried to get everybody down. Zachariah, Joseph, Mary, Elizabeth, the shepherds, and probably even the wise men since they got noticed not to go back the way they came. And so God had a special message that he wanted conveyed. Now today, when anybody thinks about the angels, the what they think of most is when they came to the shepherds. And we'll talk more about it next week, but next week is the candle of the shepherds. But imagine what it was like to all of a sudden see a host of angels, the heavenly beings, now, the Bible says they're heavenly beings, but it doesn't mean that they all necessarily have wings and halos. Are there angels in your life? Are there messengers that have come at times you didn't expect, and all of a sudden you really felt like you had something from God? Are you an angel? Are you a messenger? Does he use you? Today I've asked Anita to come up and light our candles for us. We're going to go back to the first candle, which is the candle of prophecy and hope. The second, the candle of Bethlehem and peace. And today I'm going to read to you from Luke 2, 8 through 13. And there were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around, and they were terrified. But the angel said, this is the most popular, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. For today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be his sign. You will find him wrapped in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and singing, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on, on him who his favor rests. As I read this, I just think that angel who, who was given the, the boss angel was said to be Gabriel. And he came with specific words for those shepherds. But he came to each one of those in the story with specific words from our God to be carried out. You know, like BJ said, Satan will do anything he can to try and get your mind off of what God wants you to do or about what he's got planned. So to this week, just take a moment, live in the joy and the message from God that we are his messengers to. And what is he sharing with you to share with someone else? 
Father God, I love you. I love being able to share your message about what you have for us. Lord, let us open our minds and hearts to just be ready, to soak like a sponge. And then, Father, use us. Use us, Father, to help someone to reach out, to talk, to just be the outward glowing of the inward living Christ. We love you. And they all said, Amen. Amen. Step. It was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hey guys, I uh, want to remind you each and every week that we receive an offering here at Christ Church on the Move, and we made it really simple. There's a tray on the, either side of the door when you come in. I want to bring your attention. Last week I talked about uh, just our building, um, and, and these, uh, these purple envelopes in your bulletin are on the table here. I'm asking families right now, if you would uh, just prayerfully consider a gift to, to give to the church to, to close out the year. We are trying desperately to get across the finish line with this building. We have uh, done everything within our power to, to make it as simple as we can, uh, but we have been hammered by a lot of extra policies, a lot of extra permitting and things that have to be done uh, to, to meet all the codes. Um, last week I told you there was a $40,000 underground fire line that had to be installed uh, before the building can be uh, certified. Uh, so we just, we need to pray. We need to give. Uh, we need to get this building to where it needs to be so that we can start using it and, and just, uh, so guys, just help me out with that. Um, offering, there's that. Announcements. Guys, thank you so much for, the, for the, the bags of blessings by the front door. That is amazing. Thank you so much for your generosity in that. If for some reason you forgot to bring your bag or you didn't know about bringing bags, you can call me this week. I'll, I'll make an arrangement Monday or Tuesday to come uh, let you drop it off with me or I can come pick them up from your home. Uh, if you're online and you want to get something to me, just uh, let me know so, I can, so we can bless the kids at the high school with those, uh, with those food offerings. The gro groceries, we'll deliver them this week at some point. Uh, it's always a blessing for them to have food when they go home for extended periods of time uh, during winter break. And then last, uh, Christmas Eve service. We're going to be here at Lake Aurora at 6 o'clock uh, that evening. We'd love for you to come. It's going to be a simple night. We're going to sing some carols. We're going to have a Christmas devotion, share communion together. We'll light the Christ candle. So come and gather and celebrate with us at that time. And now, uh, all of our kids, um, grades upper preschool and uh, grades to five, you guys can head on out. So we've kind of belabored the point uh, a lot this year. That this year has just been awful. It, it has been difficult. It has been uh, annoying and frustrating. And there's been so many things that have been just not what we wanted it to be, right? Um, th there are a lot of reasons why this year has been difficult. A lot of moments where we could say, man, I'm just discouraged, I'm just depressed, uh, I'm just down right now. But, but we come to Christmas, and, and, and you know, if, if you've been paying attention, you've heard it over and over again already this morning, Christmas is a season of joy, right? Like it's a season of celebration, it's a season where we should, we, 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 we come with ma wonder and magic and hope, and we just, we have expectation. Christmas is such an amazing time when we have the right perspective, and it, and the magic when you see it through the eyes of your kids. You know, it's such, a, it's such a beautiful thing. Like the kids just get so excited this time of year. Like my girls, my older ones, eh, they're not, they don't really care. But my youngest, Katie, man, her eyes light up all the time at this time of year. That She's just so excited about all this stuff. And so uh, let me tell you, this year we resurrected the advent calendar in our household. Uh, we, we strung up these, uh, these lines on the wall, and inside each day there's a card that she goes to. And, and every day as a family, we try and do something together uh, to just r slow down, to remember, to have fun. It's simple, it's silly, it's nothing big. But Katie, man, she gets so excited to pull a card. And, 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 and simple family stuff, like we did bake night one night where we, we made these little brookie, uh, these, these brownie cookie men, and then we took turns eating the heads off of them, because that's what you do with that stuff, right? The, 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 uh, we, we, we had a family night where we just did movies, uh, watched The Grinch, just huddled on the couch uh, in, in our living room. We, 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 we did a night where it was just family game night. We've been doing a lot of games. We went to our, our, our closet and just pulled out games and just played as a family, because it's just so much fun to do that. 
And we've done these simple minute to win it games where, where we all put shaving cream on our faces to make big Santa Claus beards. And, and, and then we threw cotton balls at each other to see who could get the most stuck on. Um, I gotta say guys, I'm rocking that beard, all right? That's, it's me in what, 40 years? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, girls, look at that face. Like that, they are just so excited that I'm putting these pictures up right now. Uh, so we threw we threw cotton balls at each other's faces. We did snowball races where we had to blow cotton balls across the countertop. And for whatever reason, guys, I was awful at this. Like I could not get my cotton ball to move. I had to cheat one time and use two straws to get it to go across the countertop. But uh, you know, just blowing cotton balls across the countertop and see who could do it the fastest and the best. Uh, we did uh, with our small group the other night. We did. Uh, Stick a, stick a spoon in your mouth and you had to shovel them to another bowl. And if you haven't noticed right now, we got a really good deal on cotton balls. So we had to find a way to use them. Just all kinds of silly stuff. And Katie, man, she's so excited. So excited that the picture, she's, even, she's just a blur of excitement. And guys, it's moments like these that they are just so memorable with your family. Because if you haven't heard this yet, Christmas is really about presents rather than a bunch of presents. Christmas is the story of with, right? That, that's the story we hear all the time. It's the story of with, God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. It's the story of God's love coming down to be our joy and to fill our hearts in the midst of our darkness. As the angels proclaimed and what, what, what Anne just shared a moment ago, don't be afraid, right? I'll bring you great uh, good news of great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Be filled with joy. A Savior has come. You're going to find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. And and in the story, look at how they respond. The angels, they left. When the angels left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let's go immediately. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so what did they do? They hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they went out and they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said about, said to them. But Mary, she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. They went back to the field. They went, they went back to the sheep. They went back to the darkness of the night, but something had changed in them. They came back with joy because something had happened. Something so amazing, something so profound. Their life was different in that moment. Joy to the world. Joy to the world. They respond with joy for God has come down to be with us. It was good news. And you and I, we could use some good news right now. We could use some positive press in our world. We could could use a reminder that Christ is born in Bethlehem and that, that changes everything. But this time of year, we often get wrapped up in the presence rather than the presence. And we miss the joy. We miss the celebration. Kind of like that mother I heard about one day, typical of last minute Christmas shopper. She was going here and there, everywhere, going from one store to the next, when all of a sudden she realized that pudgy little hand of her four-year-old was no longer clutched to hers. Frantically, she ran back to where she last was, and she saw her four-year-old daughter face pressed to the glass of a window, staring at a manger. Look, mommy, it's baby Jesus. Baby Jesus on the hay, look, mommy. Mommy quickly came over to her, grabbed her hand, said, oh, come on, we don't have time for that. Because Christmas is about presents and gifts and all the to-do lists. Like, see, in adult world, with all the adulting that we have to do, we have to do Christmas shopping lists, wrapping gifts and baking treats that we shouldn't eat and overspending on stuff that we don't really need and we swap gift cards to one another just to show that we care. It's so very easy to miss the magic of the moment because we're viewing the season through adult eyes, but kids, man, they see things differently. Kids haven't lost the wonder. Kids haven't lost the joy. Kids haven't lost just the excitement of the moment. They get to see the magic still. 
And so the past couple of years, we've been doing um, Elf on the Shelf with Katie, and uh, it's just something silly. We don't really dive too deeply into the characters of Christmas this time of year, but, but for the most part, like, we just, yeah, it's just something silly. It's something fun. The Elf moves around from one day to the next in different places, and, and, and the other, uh, other weekend, she challenged uh, Katie to a game of tic-tac-toe, and so in the morning, there was a move, and later in the day, there was another move, and back and forth, and eventually, Katie won the game. And so the elf brought her a little Hershey's kiss that just sat over uh, the stove. And you can't touch the elf. I mean, Katie has to get special tongs that have to move the elf back and forth and around. But she's so excited, so careful, like, I can't touch it. I'm going to lose the magic. Then in the morning, she wasn't going very quickly, so the elf brought her a little cherry Coke prize just to kind of dangle there. So she could... But I say that, like, Katie just gets so excited. Like, the sparkle in her eye, the magic of the moment. And, and, and deep down, I think she knows... Like, she knows, right? Like, she knows. Like, like, she knows what's really going on. But you wouldn't know it from looking at her. You wouldn't know from how she responds. There's excitement. There's magic. There's wonder. Every single morning. There's joy. And I look at that, and I look at my life, and I look at how I have to wrestle with all the logistics of each day, and I just wonder, I just wonder if if anyone's feeling this in the room, like, what would it take for us to respond with that kind of joy? What would it take for us to respond with that kind of uh, excitement, that kind of wonder, that kind of magic as we come to the Christmas story, as we gather around the Advent wreath, as as, as we remember the story, what, what would it take for us to respond with joy this Christmas? What do we need to feel? What do you need to see? What do you need to receive right now? Because guys, I, I, we, we've heard the story. Like, like we hear it every single year. It's the same story. We hear it. We know it. But I think the good news gets drowned out in all the noise. And so when we talk about joy to the world, we, we, we say it, we sing it. It's a really fun song to sing. But we know that joy comes with all this baggage. There's all this baggage that kind of comes along with the story. And right now, there's a lot of different stories in this room. There are a lot of different circumstances filling the seats. You, you, you don't just hit pause on everything else and uh, get, get the... No, you, you're bringing it all into the room. And this season and Christmas, December, all this, this year, like there are times we've been up. There are times that we are down. There are times that we've been happy, there are times that we are sad, times that we want to celebrate with friends, and there are times we just want to be left alone. And right now in this room, all of these different emotions are balled up inside of us. All these pressures, they're balled up right here inside of us right now. And here's what happens. Here's what happens for many people. Here's how we respond. Wherever you find yourself today, oftentimes we allow our circumstance, whether it's good or whether it's bad, to dictate how we respond to things. And so when your life is good, when things are desirable, you're going to put a smile on your face. You're going to act like everything's good. You're going to celebrate with happy hearts because my life is perfect. It's good. It's what I need it to be. I'm going to respond happily. But when our life takes a downward turn, when things don't go to the plan, when things aren't what we wanted them to be, well... We tend to allow those circumstances to dictate a more negative response. And so, our response flows from what's happening rather than what happened. See, we're letting our response flow from what's happening around us rather than what happened. God came down. Love came down. Let's remember the magic. Let's remember the manger. Let's remember that we have a reason to celebrate any moment of any day. We have, we have an opportunity to choose joy in this circumstance, in that circumstance, because it doesn't change. The circumstance doesn't change what happened. Love came down. He came to be with us. Love called us by name, and love covered our sin, and, and love invited us in, and love made us whole. And guys, we've been looking at 1 John this, this month, and I love how John writes to the church in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. He says this, he says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And, and, and that is what we are. 
John says, see what's happened for you. God has lavished you with love. It's not something that's ha- it, it, it's not something that, 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 that God has poured his love out on you. He's lavished us with love. Like a father buying gifts for his kids at Christmas, God's poured out his great love on you. And guys, I don't know what you're going through, but listen, if you belong to Jesus, you are his child. You are his son. You are his daughter. And that alone is a reason to rejoice. Children of the King, John says, guys, remember who you are. Remember whose you are right now in this moment. And what's interesting is in in, in his letters, John is um, addressing all these false teachers. Like if you understand the background to this letter, 1 John, there's all these false teachers who have tried to lead the church astray. And so throughout his letters, John calls these, uh, these believers, he says, my dear children, my dear children, my dear children, as if to, as if to remind them of their innocence, remind them uh, of, uh, of just the, 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 the station that they possess. It's endearing, it's protective. And he goes on to say in verse 7, he says, dear children, don't let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And and, and so it it calls to mind that warning from Jesus in Matthew 18, 6 to, to the false teachers of his day. He says, if anyone causes these little ones, these ones who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for a large millstone to be wrapped around their neck and for them to be drowned in the depths of the sea. John is passionate here as he's writing to combat the false teachers. He says, you're leading my children astray. You're taking them down the wrong path. And Jesus, for Jesus, it's a powerful image. It's a powerful reminder for us to be mindful of our influence because guys, right now your kids are watching you and they take their cues from us. And these false teachers in the first century, they're inviting the church to live however they want it, to indulge in the flesh, to pursue pleasure. Just be happy. Just be happy. Don't worry about sin. Sin's no big deal. And John says emphatically, no. That teaching, that word that you keep hearing, it's from the enemy. Don't go down that path. Don't let them lead you astray. You can't be in Christ and go on sinning like it doesn't matter. He says this in verse 9. He says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They, They can't go on sinning. They've been born of God. And this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. But isn't that what we're told? Just just be happy? Isn't that what we're told? Just do whatever feels good? See, it sounds like we have that teacher, that influence in our culture today. And John would say the problem is happiness fades, doesn't it? Like you just keep living for the next happy moment. Happiness fades. And sin, sin can feel really good in a moment. Like, we can feel happy for a moment. That's why it works. But listen to this, guys. Sin, sin is a debt that always comes due. And it's a payment we can't pay. And that happy moment, it winds up being a season of regret and pain and heartache and trouble. And and the writers of Scripture would tell us, listen, listen, Forget about happiness. Choose joy. Build your life on the foundation of Christ. Choose joy because joy, man, it's, it's, it's filled with life and hope and greatness. Choose joy. After all, joy is greater than happiness. Happiness is external. It's about what's happening around you. Joy is coming from within you. It's etern- and internal. Happiness is always based on chance, but joy, it's based on your choice in a moment to choose it. Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is based on Christ. And in God's Word, one of the big things that God wants for His people is for them to be joyful. 
to rejoice in the Lord always, Paul writes. Again, I will say it again, rejoice. And yet you look around at at the church, you look around at the Christian community, and, and you're just left scratching your head because so many of us don't feel very joyful. We feel bogged down by the weight of the world. We feel overwhelmed and stressed and tired and exhausted because we're not resting in the grace. Like we should be the happiest, most joyful people in the world. We should be joyful children of God because of what happened. God poured out his love on us. His amazing grace wraps around us. We've been lavished with his love. And so the issue here is we've replaced a heart of joy with the emotion of happiness. And so our temperament depends on what's happening around us. We're fun and pleasant and cheerful when things are good. But then when things change, we start giving all these excuses why all of a sudden we get to be grumps. If in your life you're looking for the next happy moment, you're going to wind up disappointed. You're going to keep pursuing the next thing and the next thing until finally you you wind up in lesser things and then sinful things. And it will be that much harder for you to ever choose joy because life will hit you over and over and over and over again. Happiness will not pay the dividends you want. You got to choose joy. You got to choose joy. And so how do we do that? Like, how do we do that? Because I want that. My guess is if I said, hey, who wants to choose joy? You guys would, yeah, I'm saying, I want to choose joy. I don't think it's, you know, completely easy, but I've simplified it for us today. Three, three letters, J-O-Y, just so we can remember them. Number one, guys, if you want joy, Jesus. You got to start with Jesus, okay? Jesus. Put your focus on him. Give him your heart. Give him your attention. This season, if you don't find yourself filled with joy, start with Jesus. Because in this celebration of Christmas, we often forget who we're celebrating. And maybe you've lost a sense of joy. Maybe you've lost a sense of wonder because you've simply taken your eyes off of Jesus. You've placed them on lesser things. What did the shepherds do? They were in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. The angels appear and say, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. A Savior has been born. And so what do they do? They leave their sheep and they go and they see Jesus. They go to where Jesus is. What you need in your life is to find Jesus, to come to the manger with fresh eyes, with a new uh, uh, expectation, with simple obedience. Take your gaze off the sheep, off your day job, off the sky where the angels lit up and find Jesus because it's all about him. They went to the manger And then they left rejoicing. So guys, let me just say this. Listen, if you don't feel like rejoicing, like maybe that's where you are. If if that's where your heart is today, like I just don't feel like rejoicing. There's so much junk in my world right now. I just don't feel like rejoicing right now. Then maybe you need to start with Jesus. Like come to the manger. Come to the cross. Come to the empty tomb and remember what he did for you. Like, you may not like everything that's happening in your world right now. I don't like everything that's happening in my world some days. But when I remember who Jesus is and what Jesus did for me, it gives me a reason to rejoice in the, uh, rejoice in the midst of all of that other stuff. I can choose joy because Jesus loves me. He gave his life for me. And he continues to lead me. That's worth celebrating. Start with Jesus. Second, oh, Gather around yourself and and, and consider the needs of others. Others. Oh, right now you need one another. Joy is magnified when we're able to gather with others. And and that's why this year is so difficult for us. Because we've been isolated. We've pushed people away. Uh, Friends don't come over like they used to. Family gatherings, the holidays are so much smaller right now. They feel more empty. They feel a lot more joyless. And so whether you realize it or not, you were wired for community. You need one another. You want more joy in your life? Gather people around you. Build relationships. Build connections with people that can share the load, share the journey with you. We need one another. You want more joy? Get people around you because you're able to encourage one another. You're able to support one another. 
Joy is magnified when others are in our story. And likewise, joy is magnified when we're able to give to one another. When we're able to pour into each other. Listen, you want to find the fastest road to get, route to get joy in your life? Go find someone in need and just give. Don't think about it. Just, just love them and give. Go take what God has given you and you go bless someone. And watch how that lights up your heart. Watch how that fills you with joy. It's not going to be about presents coming to you, but when you give gifts, man, that's going to change everything about your heart. Be a generous person. Let love well up inside of you, and then you go out and you bless someone. I mean, that's what John said to the church here in verse 16. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And so get this, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, like how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. Now, verse 17, John says, guys, go find somebody in need. You see that person and you give. For John, at the heart of the Christian faith, the idea is gift. God lavished his love on us. Jesus gave his life for us. It was all a gift. And so out of response to that profound gift, we're filled with gratitude and we give. And he says, listen, verse 17, he says, if you see someone in need, well, you have means to help. And you don't give. You have no pity. You have no compassion for them. How can the love of God be in you? This verse is very interesting in the Greek language. When you take it back to the beginning, I want to show you guys something this morning. Uh, just, uh, I want to give you just in, in a couple different translations. First of all, just kind of unpacking this. In, in, in the New Living Translation, verse 17, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Okay, that's a little different than the NIV. English Standard Version. But if anyone has the world's goods and see his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Okay. Let's take it all the way back to Old English, King James. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Just reading the Bible here, guys. So, okay. Starts with shows no pity, then it has no compassion, and then shutteth up his bowels. And you think about that, like, like, Steve, isn't that a good thing? Like, if, if, if I'm next to somebody, I want them to shut up their bowels when they're around me, right? Like, that's, that's, that feels like the right call. King James feels really weird right now. But in the original Greek, Greek language, King James got it closest to what's actually written. It's actually what John wrote. For the most part, in, in, in the idea, the, 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 the phrase in Greek is uh, kaleoing the splagnon. Kaleoing the spra splagnon. Kaleo is to shut, to close. Splagnon was intestines. It was, it was guts. It was, it was the, the upper viscera. It's that, it's that torso image in anatomy. It's, it's, it's all this junk up here, the splagnon. And so, so why is John talking about giving to somebody and talking about your guts and your splagnon and your intestine? That's weird. And so I was thinking perhaps a picture will help, okay? Um, see, we, we have our mind, and we often think that we make decisions from our mind. You have your thought life, you have your intellect, you have, you have all these things that run through your thoughts day in and day out. You have those things that you cognitively assent and affirm. In our mind, we deny things, we agree, we praise things, we condemn things, we dismiss things. We have this cognitive, logical, rational dimension of our being, and we often say that's our head. It's our head knowledge. And then we have this other dimension of our being. And if we're honest with ourselves, this is really where most of us live from. This, this upper region, this heart, this guts, this intestine, this, this, this splagnon. This is what the ancient Greeks called the splagnon of the person. And it's actually the place that we live from. It is. So you think you make decisions in your mind, but you actually let it flow from your heart. You actually let it flow through you. 
For example, you might say this, you might hear this, well, I, just, I, I, I hate that person's guts. I just, I hate that person's guts. Now, what you're saying in that moment is not that you disagree with them on, on their theories of quantum physics or whatever. You're saying that something at the core of their being sets you off. I hate who that person is. I hate the very core, the very fiber of their being. I hate their guts. Or you might say, you know what? I made this, I just felt it in my gut. It, it was a gut reaction. I made the decision because my gut was telling me this is the way to go. I, I'm just, I, I just, I, I knew it in my guts. And, and when we say that, it's not a head, it's not an intellectual, there's no rational uh, judgment here. It's, some, it's a feeling. It's something that I, I just, I felt like this is what I should do. It's just, I, I just knew it deep within me that this is the right call. This is the right decision. I followed my gut. I followed my heart. This is where I take my cues from. That's, that's why I went that way. Or, or you'll, 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 you'll hear it like when, when, when you, you say something like, I, when I got the call, I just felt it in the pit of my stomach. Right? We use these phrases. We say these things. What we're talking about is what the Greeks understood as splagnon. It's, it's this part of our being where we actually truly live from. It's not here. It's here. This is, this is where... Where, where, where our decisions flow out of. It's who we are. It's the core. It's deep in our bowels. It's the depths. It's the core of our being, the place that drives our thoughts, our emotions, and ultimately our actions. And so in verse 17, John is writing to the early church, and he's grabbing hold of this idea that there's, there's a part of, your, uh, uh, of who you are, this deep within you. This is, is, is where you decide to be generous or you shut yourself up. This right here is where you decide to love with the love of God that flows through you. Or this right here is where you decide, you know what, I'm not going to share love with that person. I'm not going to share generosity. I'm going to shut up my bowels to them. I'm going to close myself off. John is talking about who you actually are. You want to be a joyful person. You got to understand Jesus is flowing into you. His spirit is flowing. What are you letting out to others? It's splagnon. It's the intestines. Don't you see, if God's love is alive in your heart, if God's joy flows from within, how can you not be moved with compassion for someone in need? How can you not feel pain in your guts for that person when you see it so plain today? It should hit you right here. It's not something you have to think about. It's not something you have to process. Love just does. It just flows from within. So in summary, John says, um, don't be constipated this Christmas. Just let love flow. Like, don't hold it in. Be like the shepherds. You just couldn't wait, wait to let it out. You'll feel much better about it, okay? Joy will come in the morning. You'll be joyful. All right, so J, Jesus, O, others. Guys, the last one is why. Uh, you need to take time to reflect for yourself. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, this is, this is the one that I struggle with. This is one that many of you struggle with because I'm not talking about selfishness. We said Jesus first. We looked at Jesus. We, we love God. We looked at others second. We, 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 we love others but some of you, you need to listen. You need to take time for yourself. You need to take a break. You need to hit pause. Because there's a point, if we're not careful, that we're going to run ourselves ragged in a season of busyness. And you can do even good work. There's lots of good things to do. There is no shortage of good things that you can spend your time doing. All kinds of good stuff out there. But if you never take time to rest, if you never take time to reflect or recoup what you've been pouring out of you, What's going to happen is you're going to burn out. You're going to crash, and our joy gets sapped away from us in those moments. And many of us right now in this room, we are most likely tired. This year has done a number to us. Our seasons are hectic, and we're filled to the brim, and we simply don't have energy to respond with joy. Even if we wanted to choose joy, it's like we don't even have the energy to lift our hands and say, God, I choose joy right now. And so I think it's a good idea for us to hit pause. Jesus modeled this in his ministry. He often went up to the mountain to pray because he knew ministry was draining. I need to recharge. 
He found moments to pray. He found moments to reconnect. He found moments to, to restore and renew his life, his heart. And maybe today you need, to give our, you need to give your heart some time to reflect. Like in the midst of the commotion, Mary, it says in verse 19, she treasured all of these things and she pondered them in her heart. She thought about them. She reflected. She remembered. Guys, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to slow down. Because if you don't, what ends up happening, if you just give, 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 you start resenting the gift. It no longer is a blessing to you, it's an obligation. It's a burden. And when I'm obligated, when I'm burdened to do something, it takes away the joy. Don't let it get there. Take a break. Allow God to restore you. And see what happens next. You've got to take care of your heart. So let me revisit that question and we'll close. Like guys, what would it take for you to respond with joy this Christmas? Where, where's your heart today? Like, like, what's happening here? Is it being tossed around by all the things that are happening around you? Or can you rest in the moment of what happened? That moment God came down to be with us, and not just that moment 2,000 years ago, but that moment in your story where God came down to, to rest in you. When He came to life in your soul, when He poured His Spirit into you, that, that was a moment in your past, but it's a moment that still has effects now. Are you choosing joy because of what God has already done and continues to do in and through you? Do you have Christ here? Do you know that God loves you? Because if you do, you can choose joy. In any moment, you can be a joyful child of God. Amen? So God, help us to figure out how to grab hold of joy today. God, it's easy for us to get down on ourselves and say we're just bad at it. But, you know, don't let that be the answer, God. Let us just say, you know what, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to ask you to renew my heart. I'm going to ask you to restore uh, compassion where I've allowed things to just kind of fall away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see the needs around me, and I'm going to actually do something for your kingdom. I'm going to give because you've blessed me, God. I'm going to bless others. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restore joy to my heart. I'm going to come to you now. God, may that be our story today, that we could just restore the magic of this moment, that we could uh, restore the magic of the season and, and not get bogged down by the to-do list and the stress and all the anxiety that we have and not be uh, overwhelmed with loneliness or, or hurt or longing, God, but that we would just be filled with you. Allow your spirit to, to fill the, the voids that we have and just remember that you've called us to be joyful people because you're right here with us, God. Help us to focus on you in this moment. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today as we prepare our hearts for communion, I just want to come back to that, that verse in 1 John. See how great the Father has lavished His love on us. That we should be called children of God. You know, as a, as a father, um, I think about the love I have for my girls. And guys, I, I know it's not perfect. But there's nothing that would keep me from them. There is nothing good that I wouldn't do for them if it was in my power to give. And guys, I enjoy giving good gifts to my girls. I love watching them light up with excitement and joy. I love them so much. And because of that love, I want to protect them. I want to make sure they make the right decisions, the best decisions for their life. I, I, I want to encourage them. I want to keep them out of harm's way and I want to keep them on the right path. And so I will go find them when they go somewhere they shouldn't be. And I will love them, even in their rebellion. Because I want what's best for them. And my heart aches in moments where they just don't see. And I think God gives us kids because it, it's the closest thing that we can get to understand how we wreck our relationship with God all the time. Like, I look at how I see my girls and how imperfect my love is, and God loves me. 
And yet, how many times have I run away? How many times have I rebelled? How many times have I missed the mark and, and not been everything he's called me to be? And yet, John says he loves me so much, he poured out his love, he lavished me. That even in my sin, Christ died for me. Like it blows me away to think about the imperfect love that I could have and yet this Father loves me perfectly. I don't get it. I don't understand it. There's nothing God wouldn't give to his kids. No good gift that he holds back from us. How much more God's willing to give us blessing and encouragement and love and security and protection and guidance, all that and more. You are his child today in Christ Jesus. There's nothing that's going to keep him from you. Jesus came and laid down his life so that you might be brought back to God. And so as you think about that love the Father has for us, as you take the bread this morning, as you take the juice, remembering the sacrifice that was made, remember that that sacrifice was to bring you back to the God, to bring you back to the Father. May we reflect on that amazing grace today as we bow and pray. As we respond to God's word today, as we sing a song, a familiar Christmas hymn this time of year, we come to the manger, we see the Savior. Today in your life, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never placed your trust in Him, come to the cross. Come to the life that is found in Him. Come to the front of the room and talk with me about what that decision means, what it looks like. To surrender, to be made new. To start again. Let's stand and let's sing.
But guys, may we go out with our eyes fixed on Jesus. May we allow his love to flow from us to the others that we have in our story. And may we take time this week to pause and reflect on what God's doing in ourselves. Take time for yourself, guys. Be joyful people. Amen. God bless you guys.